The Sound of Waves, Chapter 13. The young girls of the island faced the arrival of the diving season with precisely the same heart strangling feeling city youths have when confronted by final school term examinations. Their games of scrambling for pebbles on the bottom of the sea close to the beach, begun during the early years of grade school, first introduced them to the art of diving, and they naturally became more skillful as their spirit of rivalry increased. But when they finally began diving for a living and their carefree games turned into real work, without exception the young girls became frightened, and the arrival of spring meant only that the dreaded summer was approaching. There was the cold, the strangling feeling of running out of breath, the inexpressible agony when water forced its way under the water goggles, the panic and sudden fear of collapsing that invaded the entire body just when an abalone was almost at the fingertips. There were also all kinds of accidents, and the wounds inflicted on the tips of the toes when kicking off against the sea's bottom, with its carpet of sharp-edged shells, to rise to the surface, and the leaden languor that possessed the body after it had been forced to dive almost beyond endurance. All these things had become sharper and sharper in the remembering. The terror had become all the more intense in the repeating and often sudden nightmares would waken the girls from sleep so deep as seemingly to leave no room for dreams to creep in. Then, in the dead of night, in the darkness surrounding their peaceful, dangerless beds, they would peer at the flood of sweat clenched within their fists. It was different with the older divers, with those who had husbands. Coming out of the water from diving, they would sing and laugh and talk in loud voices. It seemed as though work and play had become united in a single hole for them. Watching them enviously, the young girls would tell themselves that they could never become like that. And yet, as the years passed, they would be surprised to discover that, without their quite realising it, they themselves had reached the point where they too could be counted among those light-hearted veteran divers. The divers of Atajima were at their busiest during June and July. Their operations centred around Garden Beach, on the eastern side of Benton Promontory, One day, before the onset of the rainy season, the beach lay under a strong noonday sun that could no longer be called that of early summer. A drying fire had been lit, and a southerly breeze was carrying its smoke in the direction of the ancient grave mound of Prince Decky. Garden Beach embraced a small cove, directly beyond which there stretched the Pacific. Summer clouds were towering over the distant sea. As its name suggested, Niwahama, Garden Beach did indeed have the qualities of a landscaped park. Many limestone crags surrounded the beach, seeming to have been arranged purposely in order that children could hide themselves and fire their pistols in games of cowboys and Indians. Moreover, the surfaces of the rocks were smoothed to the touch, with occasional finger-sized holes as dwellings for crabs and sea lice. The sand held in the arms of these crags was pure white. Atop the cliff facing the sea to the left, the flowers called beach cotton were in full bloom. Their blossoms were not those of the season's end, looking like dishevelled sleepers, but were vividly white petals, sensuous and leek-like, brandished against the cobalt sky. It was the noonday arrest period and the area around the fire was noisy with laughing banter. The sand wasn't yet so hot as to scorch the soles of the feet. And, though cold, the water was no longer of that freezing temperature that made the divers rush to put on their padded garments and huddle around the fire the minute they emerged from the sea. Laughing boisterously, all the divers were thrusting out their chests, boastfully exhibiting their breasts. One of them started to lift her breasts in both hands. No, no, it's no fair using your hands. There's no telling how much you might cheat if you used your hands. Listen to who's talking. Why, with those breasts of yours, you couldn't cheat even if you did use your hands. Everybody laughed. They were arguing as to who had the best shaped breasts. All of their breasts were well tanned, and if they lacked the quality of mysterious whiteness, still less did they have the transparent skin that reveals a tracery of veins. Judging merely by the skin, there seemed to be no particular indication of any sensitivity. But beneath the sunburned skin, the sun had created a lustrous, semi-transparent colour like that of honey. The dark areolas of the nipples didn't stand out as isolated spots of black, moist mystery, but instead shaded off gradually into this honey colour. 
Among the many breasts jostling around the fire, there were some which already hung slack, and others whose last vestiges remained only in form of dry, hard nipples. But in most cases, there were well-developed pectoral muscles which supported the breasts on firm, wide chests, without letting them droop under their own weight. Their appearance bespoke the fact that these breasts had developed each day beneath the sun, without any knowledge of shame, like ripening fruit. One of the girls lamented the fact that one of her breasts was smaller than the other, but an outspoken old woman consoled her. That's nothing to worry about. Any day now, there'll be some handsome young swain to pet them into shape for you. Everyone laughed again, but the girl still seemed to be worried. Are you sure, Grandma Ahara? She asked. I'm sure. I knew a girl like that once before. But once she got herself a man, her breasts evened right up. Shinji's mother was proud of the fact that her own breasts were still young and fresh the most youthful among the married women of her age, as though they had never known the hunger of love or the pains of life. All summer long, her breasts turned their faces toward the sun, deriving there, firsthand, their inexhaustible strength. The breasts of the young girls didn't particularly arouse her jealousy. There was, however, one beautiful pair that had become the object of everyone's admiration, including that of Shinji's mother. These were the breasts of Hatsu. This was the first day Shinji's mother had come out to dive, so it was also her first opportunity to have a leisurely look at Hatsu. Even after she had hurled those insulting parting words at Hatsu, they had kept exchanging nods whenever they happened to meet, but Hatsu was by nature not a talkative person. Today again they had been busy with one thing and another and had not had many opportunities for speaking with each other. Even now, during the Breast Beautiful contest, it was mainly the older women who were doing all the talking, and so Shinji's mother, already prejudiced anyway, purposely avoided getting into conversation with Hatsu. But when she looked at Hatsu's breasts, she nodded to herself, understanding why, with the passage of time, the ugly rumour about the girl and Shinji had died out. No woman who saw those breasts could have any more doubts. Not only were they the breasts of a girl who had never known a man, but they had just begun to bloom, making one think how beautiful they would be once they were in full flower. Between two small mounds that held on high their rose-coloured buds, there was a valley that, though darkly burned by the sun, still hadn't lost the delicacy, the smoothness, the veined coolness of skin, a valley fragrant with thoughts of early spring. Keeping pace with the normal growth of the rest of her body, her breasts were in no way late in their development. Yet their roundness, still tinged with the firmness of childhood, seemed on the verge of awakening from sleep, seemed ready to come awake at the slightest touch of a feather, at the caress of the slightest breeze. The old grandmother couldn't resist the impulse to lay her hand against the nipples of those breasts that were so healthily virginal and, at the same time, so exquisitely formed. The touch of her rough palm made Hatsu jump to her feet. Everyone laughed. So now do you understand how men must feel about them, Grandma Ahara? Someone asked. The old woman rubbed her own wrinkle-covered breasts with both hands and then spoke in a crackling voice. What are you talking about? Hers are just green peaches, but mine? Mine are well-seasoned pickles. They've soaked up a lot of delicious flavour, let me tell you. Hatsu laughed and tossed her head. A piece of green, transparent seaweed fell from her hair to the dazzling sand. While they were all eating their lunches, a favourite man of theirs suddenly appeared from behind some rocks where he'd been waiting what he knew would be the propitious moment. The women all screamed for the sake of screaming, put their lunches back into the bamboo leaf wrappers on the ground beside them and covered their breasts. Actually, they were not in the slightest taken aback. The intruder was an old peddler who made his way to the island every season and their pretense at bashfulness was nothing but their way of poking fun at his old age. The old man was wearing a seedy pair of trousers and a white, open-necked shirt. He put down on a rock the big cloth-wrapped bundle he was carrying on his back and wiped the sweat from his face. I guess I gave you an awful scare, didn't I? Maybe it was wrong of me to come like this. Shall I go away? The peddler said this in full confidence that they would never let him go. 
He well knew that there was no better way of arousing the diver's desire to buy than by exhibiting his goods here on the beach. The divers always felt bold and open-handed when they were beside the sea, so he would have them choose what they wanted to buy here, and then the same night he would deliver the goods to their homes and collect his money. The women too liked it this way because they could judge colours better in the sunlight. The old peddler spread his wares out in the shade of some rocks. Still cramming the lunches into their mouths, the women crowded around the display. There were lengths of stencil dyed cotton material for summer kimonos. There were light house dresses and children's clothes. There were unlined sashes, underpants, undershirt and sash strings. The peddler took the lid off a flat wooden box and cries of admiration escaped from the women's mouths. The box was filled to overflowing with beautiful notions, coin purses, clog thongs, plastic handbags, ribbons, brooches and the like, all in assorted colours. There's not a thing there I wouldn't like to have, one of the young divers truthfully remarked. In a flash, many sun-blackened fingers reached out. The goods were painstakingly examined and criticised. Arguments broke out among the women as to whether something was or was not becoming to so-and-so. And half-joking bargaining grew apace. As a result, the peddler sold two lengths of summer kimono material in tawdry, towel-like patterns at almost a thousand yen each, as well as one unlined sash of a mixed weave and a large amount of sundry merchandise. Shinji's mother bought a plastic shopping bag for 200 yen, and Hatsu bought a length of the better cotton kimono material in a youthful pattern of dark blue morning glories on a white background. The old peddler was pleased with all this unexpectedly good business. He was quite gaunt, and his sunburnt ribs could be seen through the open collar of his shirt. His pepper and salt hair was cut short, and the years had deposited a number of dark splotches on his cheeks and temples. He had only a few straggling tobacco-stained teeth, which made it difficult to understand what he said, and still more so now when he raised his voice loudly. Nevertheless, by the laughter that made his cheeks tremble as though... With a twitch, and by his exaggerated gestures, the women realised that the peddler was about to render them some magnificent service, quite apart from any desire for gain. With scurrying fingers, he had let the nail grow long on the little finger of each hand, the peddler produced three beautiful plastic handbags from the box of notions. Look, this blue one is for young ladies, this brown for the middle-aged, and this black for ladies of advanced years. I'll take the young ladies one. The same old woman broke in, and everyone laughed, causing the peddler to raise his quavering voice still higher. Plastic handbags of the very latest fashion. Fixed price, 800 yen. Oh, they're dear, aren't they? Of course, he's padded the price. No, no, 800 yen without any padding at all, and I'm going to present one of these beautiful handbags to one of you ladies as a token of my appreciation for your kind patronage. Absolutely free. Dozens of guileless, open hands were simultaneously stretched forth, but the old man brushed them aside with a flourish. One, I said, just one. It's the Amaya Prize, a sort of sacrificial service rendered by my shop, the Amaya Shop, in celebration of the prosperity of Utajima Village. We'll have a contest, and one of these bags shall go to whoever wins. The blue if the victor is young, the brown if it's a middle-aged lady. The diving women were holding their breath. Each was thinking that, with just a little luck, she would receive an 800 yen handbag for nothing. The peddler had once been a grade school principal and often brooded over having come to his present humble circumstances because of a mess he'd gotten into with a woman. But now the diver's silence gave him new confidence in his ability to win people's hearts and once again he told himself that he would quit peddling and become an athletic director. Well then, if we're to have a contest, it ought to be something for the good of a Tajima village, to which I owe so much. How about it, everyone? What would you say to an abalone contest? And to the person who brings up the biggest catch in the next hour, I'll present the prize. Ceremoniously, he spread a cloth in the shade of another rock and gravely decked it with the prizes. To tell the truth, not one of the handbags was worth more than about 500 yen, but they looked worth fully 800. 
The youthful prize was sky blue and box shaped, and its cobalt colour, bright as a new built boat, made an inexpressibly lovely contrast with its glittering gold plated clasp. The brown middle aged one was also box shaped, and its ostrich skin pattern had been so exceedingly well pressed into the plastic that at first glance one couldn't tell whether it was genuine ostrich skin or not. Only the black one, for old ladies, wasn't box shaped but with its long and slender golden clasp and its oblong boat shape, it was indeed a tasteful, refined piece of workmanship. Shinji's mother, who wanted the brown middle-aged bag, was the first to announce her name for the contest. The second person who called out her name was Hatsu. Carrying the eight divers who had entered the contest, the boat pulled away from the shore. A fat, middle-aged woman, who hadn't entered the contest, stood in the stern and sculled. Of the eight, Hatsu was the only young girl. All the other girls had held back, knowing they couldn't win anyway. They were cheering for Hatsu. As for the other women left on the beach, each was shouting encouragement to her own favourite. The boat took a southward course along the beach and moved away to the eastern side of the island. The divers who were left behind gathered around the old peddler and sang songs. The water in the cove was clear and blue, and when the waves were still, one could plainly see the round rocks on the bottom, covered with red seaweed and looking as though they were floating close to the surface. Actually, however, they were deeply submerged. The waves swelled large at this point, throwing shadows of their patterns and refractions of froth over the rocks on the ocean floor as they passed over them. Then, no sooner had a wave risen full than it smashed itself to pieces on the beach. Thereupon a reverberation like that of a deep sigh would overflow the entire beach and drown out the women's singing. An hour later, the boat returned from the eastern side of the island, many times more exhausted than usual because of the competition. The eight divers sat silent in the boat, leaning against one another, each staring out toward whatever direction her eyes happened to fancy. Their wet, dishevelled hair was so tangled together that it was impossible to tell one diver's hair from that of her neighbours. Two of them were hugging each other to keep warm. All their breasts were covered with goose flesh, and in the too brilliant sunshine even their naked, sunburnt bodies seemed to turn pale, making them look like a group of pallid, drowned corpses. The noisy reception they received from the beach was out of keeping with the quietness of this boat that moved so soundlessly forward. The moment they were on land, the eight women collapsed on the sand around the fire and wouldn't even speak. The peddler checked the contents of the buckets he had collected from the divers. When he was done, he called out the results in a loud voice. Hatsu-san is first, 20 abalone, and the mistress of the Kubu family is second, 18. The winner and the runner-up, Hatsu and Shinji's mother, exchanged glances out of tired bloodshot eyes. The island's most expert diver had been bested by a girl who had learnt her skill from the divers of another island. Hatsu got to her feet in silence and went around the rock to receive her prize. And the prize she returned with was the brown, middle-aged handbag, which she pressed into the hands of Shinji's mother. The mother's cheeks flushed red with delight. But why? Because I've always wanted to apologise ever since my father spoke so rudely to auntie that day. Oh, she's a fine girl, the peddler shouted, and when everyone joined in with unanimous praise of Hatsu, urging the older woman to accept the girl's kindness, Shinji's mother took the brown handbag, wrapped it carefully in a piece of paper, clasped it under a bare arm and spoke quite casually. Why, thanks. The mother's simple, straightforward heart had immediately understood the modesty and respect behind the girl's gesture. Hatsu smiled, and Shinji's mother told herself how wise her son had been in his choice of a bride. And it was in this same fashion that the politics of the island were always conducted.